Before the Affordable Care Act, Medicare Part D beneficiaries who reached a certain level of prescription drug spending in the course of a year faced a substantial coverage gap, nicknamed the donut hole, in which they were responsible for 100% of drug expenditures. The ACA gradually closed that gap, in part by requiring drug manufacturers to offer discounts on brand name products. The Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 accelerates those changes, but it's unclear how it will affect drug prices in the long run. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Julie Donahue, a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. Dr. Donahue has co-authored a perspective article about the Bipartisan Budget Act and the closing of the donut hole. Dr. Donahue, can you tell us a bit about the history of Medicare Part D and its benefit design? Why was the coverage gap created in the first place? Part D had a somewhat unusual benefit design in that it had four different phases of coverage. So depending on how much drug spending a beneficiary had accumulated in a given calendar year, they would face very different copays at the pharmacy. In particular, the coverage gap, or nicknamed the donut hole, left beneficiaries exposed to 100% of their prescription drug costs. In the first year that Part D was in existence, 2006, the coverage gap was from $2,250 in total drug expenditures to $5,100 in total drug expenditures. What do we know about the effects of that coverage gap on people with Medicare Part D? What happened in those years? First of all, between 25 and 30 percent of beneficiaries spent some time in that coverage gap. Could be a month or six months or several months throughout the year, depending on what their total drug expenditures look like. And it caused a lot of confusion, particularly in the early years of Part D. And it also led to some cost-related non-adherence. So there are several studies that document elderly and disabled Medicare beneficiaries would skip doses of their prescriptions, delay filling prescriptions, and in some cases discontinue medications altogether because of those high out-of-pocket costs and the coverage gap. So the ACA has been making gradual changes to that benefit design, changes that would have been completed in 2020. Why were those changes considered insufficient? What led to the Bipartisan Budget Act? So what the Bipartisan Budget Act did was to accelerate and expand the size of the discounts that particularly brand name drug manufacturers are offering beneficiaries. So the ACA set up the system of discounts required starting in 2011 on up through 2020 for manufacturers to offer 50% discounts on brand name drugs in the donut hole or coverage gap. And the Bipartisan Budget Act sped up those changes and also increased the size of the discount. So it went from 50% under the ACA to 70% under the BBA. What's been the response to that, both from the health policy community and from pharmaceutical manufacturers? Well, so the pharmaceutical manufacturers actually lobbied quite heavily in the most recent Consolidated Appropriations Act to reduce the magnitude of that discount from 70% down to 60%. Ultimately, they were unsuccessful. And I should note the other key change that the Bipartisan Budget Act brought about is that it reduces the amount that Medicare Part D plans have to pay towards drug costs in that coverage gap from 20% down to 5%. So Part D plans have less skin in the game. And there's some debate over sort of who wins here, the pharmaceutical manufacturers or the Part D plans with this change. So why do you think the attempts by manufacturers, their lobbying, ultimately failed? I think that high drug prices and increased prescription drug spending is getting quite a lot of attention among the public. It's rated as one of the most important issues for Congress to address. And so I think some of the lobbying efforts might have encountered resistance because of that, really a public outcry about the high cost of prescription drugs. So you say in your article that in the short term, these changes to the coverage gap are expected to save both beneficiaries and the government money, but that the long-term effects on premiums and drug prices aren't so clear. How do you think manufacturers are ultimately going to respond to the revenue losses that these changes are going to produce? And what will that mean for patients? Right. So first of all, just to clarify the first point you made, the effect of these changes does reduce the out-of-pocket expenditures for beneficiaries who are in the coverage gap. 
So before, beneficiaries would have to pay 30% of drug costs for brand name drugs and 37% for generic drugs in that coverage gap, and that could be substantial. And both of those cost-sharing amounts go down to 25%. So that's good news for beneficiaries in the short run. What's unclear is how manufacturers will respond to this requirement to offer such steep discounts. They could turn around and either raise prices or reduce the magnitude of rebates that they give to Part D plans. And these are kind of negotiated a bit behind the scenes, these rebates. And it's the primary mechanism through which drug prices are negotiated. Remember, in Part D, the federal government is not allowed to negotiate prices on behalf of beneficiaries. They delegate that role to Part D plans. Finally, you say in your article that enrollees receiving catastrophic coverage account for more than half of Medicare Part D spending, and that under the Bipartisan Budget Act, the government will still pay 80% of their catastrophic coverage expenditures. So what are the chances that we'll see any restructuring of payments for that class of enrollees? That's a good question, and that really requires action on the part of Congress. So the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission which is charged with advising Congress on a host of issues related to Medicare, including Part D, has really sounded some alarm bells in recent years about the growth of Part D spending, which it considers an unsustainable rate, and noted that, as you said, more than half of all Part D costs are driven by beneficiaries who make it into that fourth phase of coverage. These are people with really high drug spending that reach the catastrophic coverage region where Medicare is on the hook for paying 80% of the costs. And Part D plans are required to pay a relatively low share, only 15% of the costs, and beneficiaries the remaining five. So what this Medicare Payment Advisory Commission recommended is a couple of changes. So first of all, they recommended no longer counting manufacturer discounts, these 70% discounts on brand name drugs, towards an enrollee's out-of-pocket expenditures. And what that means is it will slow down the rate at which beneficiaries reach that catastrophic coverage gap when the federal government takes on 80% of the costs. So that sort of hurts beneficiaries in terms of raising their out-of-pocket costs, keeping them in that coverage gap a longer period of time. The other change that would reduce out-of-pocket spending is that MedPAC would recommend eliminating all beneficiary cost sharing for those reaching the catastrophic coverage region. So enrollees or beneficiaries would go from paying 5% of drug costs down to zero once they reach that threshold. Thank you, Dr. Donahue.